So I think we're live on YouTube, so I will, I will go ahead. And as people are still filing in, I'll just um, welcome everyone to this evening's presentation and thank you for joining us. Um, and while everyone's getting settled, um, I'll just, for the people who are coming in, just remind you that if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the chat and we'll, we'll ask them at the end of the presentation. Um, so for those of you who, who don't know us, or who are new to us, I, I wanted to let you know that uh, I'm Judy Kitt. I'm the president of the Foundation for Mind Being Research um, or FMBR. And uh, we were founded 41 years ago in 1980 by scientists and artists and healers who were interested in exploring the nature of human consciousness through the lens of science and spirituality and ancient wisdom traditions. We're part, we're a, among a growing group of organizations who are helping to create a cultural shift away from exclusively reductionist approaches to science so that we can have a fuller understanding of the range of human experience and the nature of reality. So I encourage you to check us out on fmbr.org and you can look at all of our past presentations on our YouTube channel, which is FMBR TV. Um, so we are very honored to have E.M. Nicolet with us this evening, um, along with his co-author Lee, who will be managing the slide presentation and we're very grateful to her for that and uh, for her expertise as well. Um, E.M. Nicolay is an internationally known intuitive, clairvoyant, remote viewer, author, and workshop leader. He has authored numerous books on a wide range of metaphysical and esoteric topics, and for over two decades has worked with thousands of individuals to explore the spiritual, energetic, and karmic patterns that influence the manif manifestation of their day-to-day -day reality. Early in his awakened career, he began assisting Jungian psychotherapists with particularly difficult cases using his intuitive and clairvoyant abilities. His reputation as an intuitive grew quickly and he became known to a wide range of healers, clerics, and business leaders. As his reputation grew within certain circles, he was recruited by various international organizations to employ his remote viewing abilities on their behalf. He has written a series of books called The Essence Path Books, which include Discovering Your Essence Path, book one and two, the System Lords and the 12 Dimensions, Time Collapse and Universal Ascension and the Samuel Sessions. Um, the newest book in the Essence Path series, The Wheels of Creation, Life After Death, Reincarnation and the Journey of Your Soul um, is what we're here to discuss this evening. So um, Jean, we're really grateful to have you here with us this evening. Uh, I was looking and it's been almost exactly three years ago that you were here. It was in February of 2017 to discuss the timeline collapse work and the universal ascension. Um, and we're really interested to hear about the continued evolution of your work. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you, Judy. It's great to be here and uh, welcome everyone. Um, if, if it's okay with everybody, I'd like to start off uh, with a brief meditation. So I'm going to ask if everyone could please just take a deep breath in, a cleansing breath, and then release. And when you're ready, envision a beautiful golden white light coming down into your crown chakra. Down further through the third eye, through your throat, into your heart chakra, down into the solar plexus, down into your root being, and continuing down through your feet, grounding you into the earth. And when you feel comfortable and relaxed and cleansed from the golden white light, bring the light up into your heart. Gather it into your heart chakra and allow it to flow freely in front of you. 
And as it flows in front of you, imagine that it creates a path. And when you're ready, follow this path. It's a beautiful path that leads you through a garden, up into a hill, climbing further up the hill into the distance. And there you see a beautiful temple. And you recognize this temple and you are drawn into it. The temple is warm and golden. And you approach the doors and you go into the temple and in the large space in the middle of the temple, there is a round table and you see individuals sitting at this table, however many individuals is up to you, but you recognize them and they look vaguely familiar. And you walk up to the table and you see that there is one place that is your place at the table. And you take your seat. And as you sit, you realize that these individuals at the table are connected to you. They are from all different periods of linear time. And you recognize them and they recognize you. And you begin to realize that these are lifetimes created by the same soul that created you. And you understand that the things happening in their lifetimes are dynamic and moving back and forth into your lifetime. And the things you do in this lifetime and the karma that you create is balanced by these other lifetimes and the karma they create and the energetics of the relationships that happen in their lifetimes flow through to you. All of this happening simultaneously. All of it changing dynamically. And when you're ready, you thank them and you tell them that now you are aware that what you do in this lifetime affects them in their lifetimes. And you thank them for being aware that what they do in their lifetimes is affecting you dynamically in your lifetime. And as you rise to leave, you know that you will see them again. You know that they are part of you and you are part of them. And each of you is an individual consciousness and a cell in the body of your soul. And as you leave the temple, you return feeling fulfilled and grounded and aware that these lifetimes 
are you and your lifetime is them and you are one with your soul just as your soul is a cell in the body of all that is in the universe. And when we're ready, open your eyes and feel refreshed and purified, present and conscious. So I thought I would start everyone by giving a little bit of a background <clears throat> for those people who don't know me of where this information is actually coming from and where I've been and uh, sort of how we got to this particular point with the Essence Path series. And I guess it starts at the beginning. And the beginning is really, I had a very normal childhood, except for the fact that I was the kid who would sit on the steps and say, Uncle Don was just here. And he came to say hello. And the parents and the adults would all snicker and say, oh, but you know that Uncle Don lives hundreds of miles away. And it's not possible. You understand that. And then an hour later, they'd get the call that Uncle Don had had a massive heart attack and passed away. And... I had experiences like that as a child on a regular basis, particularly up to the age of probably six or seven, maybe eight, uh, even to the point of telling my mother that uh, you're not my mother, you're actually my husband and I'm your wife and we are farmers in Neverland. And once again, everybody would laugh and say, oh, Neverland, yes, oh, just like Peter Pan. And I would say, no, like in Holland, where they have these windmills. So these things would continually happen. But of course, as with a lot of um, intuitive and sensitive children, and I, I'd say all children in general, this was um, drummed out of me as something that was really not kosher, not acceptable. And let's be realistic and let's be down to earth. So I grew up really trying to submerge these types of uh, experiences, although I had them frequently. And uh, that pretty much was until about my teenage years. And there was one little episode that I was gonna talk about, and I don't know why it's relevant to this group. However, I had a dream a couple of days ago that it was relevant and it reminded me of this experience. So hopefully someone in the group will be able to tell me why it's relevant. But as a teenager trying to push all of this down, I uh, went on a, uh, a business trip with my father, uh, he, his business, and he was taking his son. And it was a trip to Europe. And somehow the, the seats on the flight got mixed up and we weren't seated together. And he was seated two rows behind me. But I was sitting next to this young man who acted as though he recognized me. And for an entire trip to Europe, he talked to me as if I was a peer of his. And he told me things like, 
people like us need to do this and do that. And this is how we will be received. And this is what you need to know. And he told me stories about how he had been contacted by extraterrestrials, how during his meditations in Mount Sinai, he had been contacted and that's where his powers came from, that he was intuitive like I was as a child. And I, I listened really not fully understanding what he was even talking about. And at the very end, he gave me a medallion, which I still have, that he told me to watch for this symbol because this symbol will be something that will awaken you when the time is right. So we arrived and of course parted ways. I didn't know who he was and I was pretty much a kid. I was a young teenager maybe 13, 14. And uh, my father said to me, do you know who that was? And I said, no. And he had apparently talked to the stewardess and it turned out that this was Yuri Geller, who for better or for worse was a, um, a psychic who was fairly well known, I guess in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and I, at the time, did not know who it was, but as I said, I had this dream a couple of days ago that I needed to mention this to this particular group because there is a connection somehow that um, apparently uh, you, the group has with this particular person. But in any case, continuing the story, I had things like this happening to me constantly, and I did my best to ignore them and to uh, really submerge them and to, to become sort of, a, you know, a, a member of society um, who was not um, sort of particularly interested or working in those kinds of uh, fields. And I became a, um, a member of the business world and very high profile corporate jobs but I continued to have some difficulties because um, whenever I would work with people, I would, uh, I would say things that would shock them that ultimately would come true. As an example, uh, I was working at a, at a large company and there was a major event that the company was sponsoring, the Guggenheim Museum. And I happened to have been with the CEO. And this is a several hundred million dollar company. And I, I said, he said to me, as we were sort of left standing for a couple of minutes together, that, you know, isn't this just a wonderful event? And isn't this going to really do something for the company? And uh, for some reason I blurted out, well, Yes, but it really doesn't matter because you won't be here in five years and the company won't be here in seven. Well, I left shortly after that, needless to say, although, you know, I was treated very well and I think uh, people kind of had an inkling of who I was even at that time or the intuitiveness that I kind of displayed. But ultimately it turned out that in five years, this young CEO who was in his early forties passed away of a very rare cancer. And two years after that, the company, which was privately held by him and his family was sold to a competitor who assimilated the entire company and then discarded the name and closed everything. So I had experiences like this constantly and they started to become more and more prevalent. And ultimately what happened was one day, a friend, and I was working in New York at the time, I called up and said, you know, I have a good friend who just moved to New York. She's a Jungian psychologist and she really needs some help. 
she needs you to do her website for her and to help her with some marketing issues. And I said, okay, well, you know, no problem. She's a friend. I'll do it as a favor and, you know, help you out in my spare time. Great. So I did some materials for her, put together her website, put together some different things. And she was thrilled with everything. Apparently it was very successful. And so she kept calling me, asking me to please come over so that she could do something for me. Um, she would like to give me a session. She was a hypnotherapist as well as a Jungian psychologist and said, you know, I'll do anything for you. And I, I didn't, I didn't follow up. And then one day I had a very important business meeting where I was going to make a presentation. And, uh, I said, you know, I could actually, maybe she could give me some suggestions, some hypnotic suggestions to actually relax me so that I can, you know, do this presentation, um, you know, very well. And because I'm, I'm not the best presenter, to be honest. And uh, it's just not something that, uh, you know, I really did. I was always the behind the scenes person. So anyway, she of course agreed and I went over and she said, okay, well, here, let's just relax and sit down for a minute. And she started in to hypnotize me. But within 30 seconds of starting, I had to say to her, please stop talking because I distinctly hear this voice, not in my head, but to the right-hand side of me right over my shoulder. And I heard the voice say to me, this is how she helps people in the world. But the time has come, if you will allow it, for you to help people in ways that right now you can't even imagine. At that particular point, apparently, um, I went into full trance. And when I came out of it, uh, there she was, completely shocked, and telling me, don't worry, I taped everything. It turns out that um, what was said when I was in trance, which I really did not recall, was that I had a soul agreement to begin working with a group of seventh, seventh dimensional guides who had come together for the purpose of helping people to discover their soul's path, which they termed their essence path. After that experience, which was very profound, I started realizing that I was seeing auras around people. And odd things started happening where I would get into a taxi and I would just be inundated by, I guess what you could call uh, spirits or messages being given to me, where as an example, the wife of a taxi driver would say, you have to tell him I'm okay, you have to tell him I'm okay. And I would apologize, I would say, I'm terribly sorry, but you know, do you know, um, a woman who says she's your wife, who wants you to know that she is okay and that you'll be fine. And the very macho taxi driver would burst into tears and we'd find out that his wife had died two weeks earlier. So I started having things like this happen to me. And then one day, not too long after, the Jungian therapist called up and said, you know, I was thinking that maybe you could help me with a few of my cases. And without giving any names or without meeting the people, she would give me the first name of a person. And she would say, could you look into what their issue is and see how it relates to their life path, how it relates to their mission in this lifetime, what their personality features are that they were actually dealing with and 
tell me how I can best help them. Well, that was an interesting process because what happened after that was um, people started calling me out of the blue from all over the world. And it turned out that they were therapists for the most part who had similar experiences and were asking for my help. And I would do what I could. And at that particular point, I was still very much working in the, the business world and the corporate world. So I'd be up until midnight, one in the morning, talking to people all over the country and all over the world, um, trying to help them with their experiences. I guess I should back up and say also, one of the interesting things about the way that I work, and I think that possibly it's relevant for a lot of uh, intuitives. When I first had the experience with the therapist of going into trance, what happened was the walls turned into liquid. And I realized that I could see beyond the walls into the next office. And then beyond that, I could see into the next building. And then beyond that, I could see into the next city. And this expanded so that when I was working with these people, I would be able to go into what could fully conscious, but would be, could be termed a sort of semi-trance and be able to access their information. And I would look into what could be termed Akashic records, what could be termed their, their soul's information. And depending on where I turned my eyes, that's where I could focus in on different bits of information. And that was the beginning and the kernel of what later became sort of a talent for remote viewing, where I, I can only approximate this to, or, or give as an example, if you were in a field and there were vast stretches of land all around you and mountain ranges around you. And depending on where you put your focus, suddenly that would come flying forward to you and you could see it in every detail. This is the way that I was able to look at their information. To make a very long story short, ultimately what happened was I um, continued working with different people. And then one day had a, another dream. A lot of this happens to me in the dream state. And I had another dream where it was announced that it was time for us to begin writing a series of books. And the series of books would be called the Essence Path books. And that began this journey, truly. The, um, the first book, the first two books were called Discovering Your Essence Path. The first one gave some very interesting information about how to discover what your essence path is. Essentially, it gave background with respect to the concept that everyone comes into the lifetime with a mission. And what happens is in conjunction with your soul, you plan the environment that you're going to grow up in so that it creates the parameter, the parameters, if you will, the, the glasses with which you see the world. And through this, you experience opportunities to explore your life lesson. And the interesting thing about it is that your soul is never really doesn't care about good, bad, right, or wrong. They're really 
there is polarity and there is negative and there is positive because there everything is based on polarity and spin but you can experience your life lesson from either the negative pole or from the positive pole. In other words, your soul doesn't care if you have decided, as an example, to learn about, learn lessons of love in this lifetime. Your soul doesn't care if you learn lessons of love through beautiful, loving experiences for your whole entire life, or if you learn that same lesson through difficult, hateful, tragic, awful experiences around love. What it's really concerned with is the fact that you are learning your life lesson and you are accomplishing your mission for this lifetime. But clearly it becomes much easier to, to live life if you understand that you can live your life lesson and your life path in either the positive or the negative pole, but that you have the ability to switch and learn your life lesson from the positive polarity. And the key to that seems to be a conscious understanding of what your personality features are. In other words, the features that you chose to have placed around you with which you see the world, the reason why you chose your parents, the reason why you chose the environment that you chose to grow up in was to create these parameters. And those parameters can be experienced once they are understood from either the positive or the negative. So that if your personality is related to, as an example, lessons around pride, feeling good about who you are versus feeling insecure and always looking over your shoulder. The key to this is understanding and recognizing that the issue is around your feelings of self-worth and by consciously changing that to the positive polarity, that actually goes out into the world and it magnetizes the opportunities that come to you to learn your lesson from the positive pole instead of the negative pole. So following the example, if you have a sense of feeling good about who you are and feeling a sense of pride in yourself. That actually creates a vibration and a resonance around you that will go into the world and will attract to you loving situations. And you will learn the lesson of love through having loving situations in your life. If on the other hand, because of the parameters that were created in childhood or through your environment or however. If you are insecure and always looking over your shoulder, that creates a vibrational pattern that when it goes out into the universe, into reality, it draws to you a reality where the experiences that you have around love are actually hateful, difficult, challenging situations. You have to remember that in terms of polarity, positive and negative, it's two sides of the same coin, which is why your soul isn't concerned with how you learn the lesson. It only knows that you have decided to learn in this particular lifetime lessons around love. And it's up to you to be conscious of yourself, to know thyself, essentially, in order to be able to push the life lesson into the positive polarity. So the first two books dealt very much with how you create your reality. I think that it's one of the, um, the problems with uh, The Secret, which was very popular a couple of years ago. It didn't take into 
uh, uh, consideration, the fact that you can learn these lessons from either pole and that how you set up the lifetime becomes very important in terms of what you actually are attracting into your life. And it's not enough to just think positive thoughts or think about what you want because all of that is filtered through the glasses that you wear. It's more important to know thyself and to become conscious of what the parameters are and what your personality features are in order to then create a resonance and a vibrational pattern around you that magnetizes to you things in life that are similar to that vibrational pattern. Remember, like attracts like. There were other things in the Discovering Your Essence Path book. The second book dealt uh, extensively with the concept of fear and faith. And again, the polarity, two sides of the same coin, and how having faith in the universe is so important versus fear. That book was um, created around the same time as the uh, as 2001 and 9-11. So it became very important. And the reason I believe that it was written was to actually give people an idea of how important your belief structure was and how important your emotions and your intention, your conscious intention are in creating your reality. And that when you go into a state of fear, then only fearful things, challenges can be attracted to you. So the Discovering Your Essence Path, books one and book two, sort of set the groundwork. And then 2012 came along. And 2012, I was with, um, I bumped into actually someone that, that uh, I knew not very well that I knew and she was with her 10 year old son. And as you'll recall, that was the time where everybody was talking about the end of the world. And this 10 year old was completely freaked out that the world was ending because of course that's what he had been hearing in the news and that's what he had been seeing in the movies. And then there were another group of people who were saying, okay, well, you know, this thing called ascension. And we're all just going to wake up one day in the fifth dimension and we're gonna pop off and be in the fifth dimension. And that, that period um, led to a book called The System Lords and the 12 Dimensions. And it actually gave a, a beginning viewpoint of what ascension is all about and what is what 2012 is all about and what is actually happening in the world. And it detailed um, very interesting, what I, what I call a metaphor, because these are not, I mean, they, they, are, they are beings, they are guides, but um, the designation of system lords can be kind of misleading but that there are what they called physical system lords and spiritual system lords who are souls from the ninth universal dimension who are able to come back and incarnate in physical lifetimes. And again, the physical lifetimes are very similar to what we'll talk about momentarily with regard to us as to how it works, but the physical lifetimes that are created by these system lords are essentially avatars, but they, they have their own life lessons and their own life missions. And they do not know that they are associated with system lords. And they come into the world to influence mass consciousness in order to create a mass consciousness backdrop against which every day beings have an opportunity to grow. So the phys physical system lords are mostly related 
to incarnations that are geopolitical in nature. Whereas the spiritual system lords will come in and they're related to changing the spiritual outlook and um, the spiritual consciousness of humanity or what they call the human angelic soul group, which defines most of us. So that book was very interesting. Um, and it also talked about ascension and gave the beginnings of what ascension is really about. Ascension is an evolutionary process. It's the evolutionary process of the universe and all souls in it. And it can get kind of complex, so I'm not gonna get into it too much. Um, the, the book actually details it. But ascension is when the dimension and the time spiral or the timeline of the dimension that defines the dimension evolves into the next higher dimension. And at the same time, souls that are incarnating in that particular dimension, if they are ready, having had many lifetimes in the dimension, will tend to cycle off and they will evolve and they will ascend to the next universal dimension as well. So that book gave kind of the beginnings of the background. And then we moved on and I was again through a dream told that we needed to do a book now now this is going, this is about 2015, 2016, where we did a book called Timeline Collapse and Universal Ascension. The book is a two-part book. And in part one, it gave predictions and remote, that were remote viewed for the future. It's an interesting book because in part one, um, that detailed how the energetic shifts in the world are moving to the East. It gave details about what actually will happen with regard to the deterioration and the ultimate breakup of the United States, which unhappily is, is not, um, not something that um, any of us want. But a lot of the things that were predicted in that book, not all of them, but a lot of them have already happened. It details how the United States ultimately will break into regional unions, uh, among them, the New England Union, the Pacific Coast Union. Uh, there'll be a union in around the Texas, around Florida, and around the Chicago area. And then it gives future predictions all the way through the 26th century of what will transpire. And as I said, some are, have started to come true. Um, others remain to be seen and are still sort of um, up and coming. We've double checked them on the uh, timeline. And although time is dynamic, and time can is very difficult to pinpoint because when you when you look at it on the timeline, it shifts and it can change. So timing is very difficult. And I think most uh, most people who are psychic or intuitive or remote viewers will tell you that. But for the most part, most of the things and most of the events that um, are predicted in there are transpiring. Uh, right now. The interesting thing about it is that in book two, which I think is a very interesting book of that same, that same book or part two of that same book is all about life in the fifth dimension, which is on planet earth in the fifth dimension is known as Terra. And the reason for that is that we were told that 
many people will be cycling off incarnations, older souls in particular, will be cycling off their incarnations in the third dimension where we are currently, and will be beginning incarnations in the fifth dimension on the planet Terra. And that's a fascinating look, I think, at what you can expect uh, on Terra. There are many differences. There's differences in appearance. There's differences in intuitive abilities. There's differences in what they call the time lag of creation, where what you think in our particular, in the third dimension, what you think and your emotions take time to manifest in reality because there is a time lag because our consciousness is not, dare I say, up to standards and up to par. So there is ample time to actually change that. In other words, you don't, because you think of a pink elephant, you don't want it to appear in the room with you. In the fifth dimension, the time lag is much less because the consciousness is much higher. And incarnations there are have as almost one of their senses what we would call intuitive abilities here, and they are very telepathic. In any case, I won't get into it in detail, but it is an, it is an interesting look at what happens um, sort of in a fifth dimensional reality and what, what fifth dimensional uh, living in the fifth universal dimension is all about. Um, that book, after we wrote it, led to the current one. I had, a again, a, a dream where I was told that coming up over the next several decades, many, many individuals, particularly individuals who are older souls, would be cycling off the planet and would be moving on and would be ascending because we are currently in a galactic ascension period. And I was told that what is most needed is a roadmap to actually what happens to you when you pass away. And so the new book, Wheels of Creation, is an attempt to try and guide us through a lot of information that has been lost through time or submerged or hidden from us that actually helps us to understand where our soul comes from, how it journeys through various universal dimensions, how it creates lifetimes that we know as reincarnations, what happens after you die and your consciousness continues on through the higher astral planes and how the entire process works vis-a-vis -vis the structure of the universe. The, the book is called Wheels of Creation because the soul, when it enters a dimension creates lifetimes that are on what appear to be wheels. And these lifetimes are interconnected. And because, actually, before we can even talk further about that, we need to talk about the, the manner in which the universe is structured. So the universe has what, what are called universal dimensions. And there are 12 of them. And they are nested one on top of the other, similar to sort of the Russian doll concept. And each universal dimension is a particular timeline. In fact, the spiral of the timeline is what creates the universal dimension. Now, the book talks about this, but talks in specific terms about 
the third universal dimension because we, the human angelic incarnations are in the third universal dimension. And as I said, there's 12. The third universal dimension though breaks down into 12 sub-levels. And there you see on your screen, the first being the planetary being, minerals, the, the realm of lower thought forms. The second is the plant and elemental kingdoms, the divic kingdom. The third is where human angelics incarnate in physical form. And then beginning in the fourth, after physical death, your consciousness in a non-corporeal form continues on through all the other sublevels until it reaches the 12th sublevel, which is where your soul resides. Now, there's a lot of complexity to this and it's all defined in the book. Uh, but so I'm trying to encapsulate a lot of information in a very short period of time. But what you need to know is that depending on what universal dimension you're in, that's where incarnations begin. So since we're in the third universal dimension, our incarnations, our physical life incarnations start in the third, wait, I want to go back one, the start in the third sub level. You want to go back, Lee? The third sub level is for physical incarnations, but the sub levels are divided into trilogies, which actually surprisingly enough is where the whole concept of the, uh, the magical power of three or the, the trinity in religious thought comes from this. And very important to understand is that higher can see lower, but lower cannot see higher because of the vibrational structure and the vibrational rate. So in the, th in the, at the third level where we incarnate, we can see the divic kingdoms, but we see it as plants, but we don't experience their life because they are existing in the second universal dimension. And we can see the planet and we can see minerals and we can see crystals and we can see mountains and we can see oceans, but we don't understand that those are actually beings that are starting incarnations in the first universal dimension. What becomes really fascinating and is covered very extensively in the book is not only the structure that you see here, but more importantly, what actually happens after a physical incarnation is over and you continue on. When you leave the physical body, you continue your consciousness. And what happens is your energetic body in much the same way that it enters in the first place, recedes up through the chakras and through the cord and consolidates your mental body and your emotional body into your energetic body and your etheric and discards the physical shell. And it's actually that energetic body that links you to your soul that actually creates your lifetime. When that actually leaves, you enter into what is very similar to the dream state. And the fourth astral plane is described as almost like lucid dreaming. It's a pass through where each individual learns that what they think is created. So that when you think of something once, and again, this is once your energetic body has consolidated, 
When you think of something, it's created. When you think of someone, you are there. They are with you. That particular plane, the etheric plane, the fourth sublevel, is where you kind of learn the ropes of existing in a non-physical world, but you're the same consciousness that you are. And your mission at this particular point through all of this is to rejoin your soul, which resides in the 12th sublevel, linked back to the 12th universal dimension. One of the most interesting things is the progress that you make from the fourth through the seventh, truly, astral planes. I wish I could get deeply into it with you right here. I can't because it's just too complex and it is covered in the book. But once you have figured out in the fourth astral plane what and how reality is created and how you feel and what you think manifests itself because now we are no longer dealing with time as we know it. You are brought to the astral realm of healing. Now, this is where, very interestingly, you examine your life. So some of the things that you've heard, and, and I do have to say that a lot of the information um, that you've heard in the past, bits and pieces of, you know, there's a heaven here and there's a this there and there's a this, they, there are remnants of the truth in those things, but they are a bit misleading and they are scattered and they do not actually show you the entire process and the progress, um, the way that uh, this is revealed to us. But in the astral realm of healing, that is the plane of healing for entities so that they now achieve an awareness of what their life was about. And it's in that particular realm that they sort of start to have an inkling of what their mission was about, but they particularly then explore some of the karmic imbalances and some of the karmic issues and the relationships that they had. And they're able to see it from all sides of the equation. Based on that, it's, it's um, and actually the book says that it's also called the cathartic plane because it truly then releases you, it releases the karma and allows you to be the truest form of yourself. Interestingly enough, um, that realm is seen differently by different people. It depends on your perspective because you're carrying the perspective from your consciousness still. And some people see it as an institution. Some people see it as a, um, as a college, a university. Some people see it as a museum. It really depends on you. But ultimately what happens here is there is what the proverbial review of your life takes place. Now this is without judgment because there is no judgment that is going on here. What it's really the objective of the fifth astral plane is to bring you to a place where you are able to release a lot of the karma and a lot of the karmic energy and debris, and you are able to find the truest form of who you are. And why this is important is because once you have left that realm, when the time is right, and there is no timing here. Each person is different. Everything is completely different. But once you are ready, you move into what is called the astral realm of perceived heaven. Now, this is where the mythology of, the, of your eternal rest comes from in perceived heaven. And, what, and the reason for that is because once you have been through the astral realm of healing and have discovered your true self or how you truly feel about your accomplishments and what you did in life. 
perceived heaven is reflected back to you. And that's interesting because a lot of people will be have reflected back to them how they felt about um, their accomplishments. And so it's essentially a pleasing place. It's, it's pleasurable. But a lot of people who are not, uh, I'll call them entities at this particular point, that are not very happy with what they accomplished will tend to then have reflected back to them a less than optimal environment. Regardless of that, and again, this is not about punishment or about any good or bad or right or wrong. It merely is that it becomes a reflection of truly who you are and who you perceive yourself to be, which is why it's perceived heaven. Ultimately, that is a resting stop. And as described in the book, the true death, even more than the physical death, is the death that you experience when you leave perceived heaven. Because over time, and it, there is no time, but however long it takes, it takes. But eventually everyone tires of perceived heaven. And it's at that particular point that they are ready, having explored every facet of themselves, because that's what happens in perceived heaven, since it's a reflection of everything that you want that is inside of you. That's when you take on your light body. And that's when you move into the true celestial realms. And the seventh astral plane is called celestial heaven, because that's where you start to have the connection with your soul. That's where you start to understand the connection with your soul and who you truly are. It's at that particular point that you begin to lose a lot of who you were in physical incarnation and take on a larger, more expansive consciousness that is not only you, but now starts to include all the other lifetimes of your soul. So this continues through and you, you don't pass, once you get to the seventh astral realm, there is no more a lateral progression and now the progression becomes more um, horizontal. I, I'm sorry, I should say it's, it's not a linear progression. It's not a uh, up and down. It's more of a horizontal and a lateral pro progression so that the reason why in celestial heaven you understand about your soul and the lifetimes that your soul has had is because you are able to now access through the assistance of master guides information that's found in the Akashic records. And there is a whole chapter on the Akashian records, which I think is very interesting about the electromagnetic imprints and how those are actually carried into the world and how people use those or how in entities together with their soul use that to plan lifetimes. And then there will be certain specialties once you take on your light body that you will start to explore in all these other realms, again, moving towards reintegration with your soul. Now, all of the lifetimes that your soul is having are happening simultaneously because time as we know it is really just a measurement, it's a linear measurement, but it really doesn't exist. The timeline itself is a spiral. And when the soul plans lifetimes, and this is what gets interesting, a lot of the misconception of reincarnation is thinking that one lifetime follows another. The truth of the matter is that when your soul comes into a universal dimension, whatever it might happen to be, and in this case, the third, it actually creates these wheels of creation, lifetimes, that it places on the timeline that are all happening simultaneously because that is how 
the uh, time spiral works. The, the lifetimes then have association. And you can see that there can be an association that could be that you could have with a lifetime in Atlantis because it is in close proximity to a lifetime that you have now or one that you had in 1750 or one that you had in the future in 3000. Again, all of them happening at the same time. And what's even more fascinating here is that because this is dynamic and because these are lifetimes that are sent out or projected out manifest by the soul, all happening at the same time, and because there's free will, karma is also dynamic and happening simultaneously. And therefore, what happens in one lifetime is being balanced by the other spokes on the wheel, possibly your own lifetime, as, as it happens. And as this all occurs during the physical lifetimes, it also continues to happen as you climb through the astral realms. I think, I think that one of the most important things to understand about how this works, aside from the fact that the journey of your soul happens through the universal dimensions, is the fact that you are not only linked with other lifetimes as a soul, as a cell in the body of your soul, all happening at the same time, but that what happens in those other lifetimes has the potential to bleed through into your lifetime currently. And what happens in your lifetime has the potential to bleed through into those other lifetimes of the soul. And as this occurs, the wheel is balanced, similar to the way you put weights on a wheel of a car to balance it. Lifetimes are the weights on the wheel that are balancing it and they are balancing with each other. Um, if we could go back to the slide that is, yeah, right there. I think it's important to understand that when your soul comes into a universal dimension, whatever that dimension might happen to be, it will start from the 12th universal dimension, which is where all creation starts. And the soul is cast out into, say, the first universal dimension. And then we'll begin physical incarnations in whatever sublevel is related to that dimension. So in this case, it will start incarnations in the first universal dimension. And it's quite possible that a human angelic soul, of which you are an entity, of a, of a human angelic soul, you may have started with your soul creation in the first universal dimension as a mountain range or as a drop of water in the ocean or a, a crystal. And when that lifetime, that physical lifetime is over, you then will climb with all your other lifetimes that are on the wheel of creation through all the sublevels. And once they have all gathered up once again in the 12th universe dimension, the soul is then ready to ascend. And that is truly ascension. Ascension is movement, evolution into the next universal dimension as part of your soul, 
after you have had a journey through the universal dimension. And following the example, then the second universal dimension, there are many people that I've seen who have a connection to the Devic kingdom. And they might have spent a long time incarnated um, as a, a fairy or a gnome. Um, and then moved on up into the, the sublevels, into the 12th sublevel of the second dimension. And then that's when they move into incarnations in the third sublevel of the third universal dimension, which is where human angelics physically incarnate as human beings. And then they go up through the sublevels that we were just talking about. This, can, this pattern continues on and on through all of the universal dimensions. And it's interesting here because what you see as green too, that's Terra in the fourth through sixth Earth is the first through the third. Gaia is the planet Earth in the seventh through the ninth. And ultimately, your soul, together with you and your consciousness, because that does not disintegrate. That is forever and ever a part of your soul, will ultimately reach the 10th universal dimension. And at that particular point, will move through any of the 10th, 11th, or 12th universal dimension that it chooses until such time as it then reunites with the God force and becomes one with the universe. And this is the evolution and expansion of the universe and the God force itself. So, so the book, will actually give you a guide to not only the process of being born, of going through life and of dying, and then the sublevels that, it, that you will go through when you actually pass away and how that passage occurs, but it further gives you the way in which your soul progresses through all the universal dimensions and just as you are making an effort in this dimension as a cell in the body of your soul, as a lifetime of that soul, to reintegrate and rejoin your soul in the 12th sublevel of the third universal dimension, your soul ultimately will ascend through all of the universal dimensions together with you to become part of the expansion of the universe. This is the reason why the universe is growing. This is the reason why the universe appears to be a being that is pulsating, that is breathing, because it is actually constantly growing as it reintegrates souls that have accomplished ascension and its journey through the 12 universal dimensions, while further casting out new souls and new soul groups who are doing this journey on a regular basis forever and ever, essentially without end. So that gives you a very, very brief sort of background. I know it's, I know it's a little complex. It might have been a little bit difficult to follow. I think the, the, it's a long book, but the book actually spells out much more detail and much greater detail about how this all happens. And I think, Judy, with that, um, I'll turn it back to you and maybe we could uh, take a look at questions for anyone. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Um, I'm trying to digest. This is, this is amazing and wonderful. Um, and it looks like I have lost my video. All right. <laughs> um, um, okay, I think I can find it. There it is. There you are. Okay, good. Um, 
There's a question coming in from YouTube. Is there just one soul or are there many? There, there are many souls and actually um, th there's an image that we didn't show you, but what happens is th there are many, many souls and there are soul groups and there are different cadres. We seem to be, from what I'm told, the human angelic soul race. There are soul races actually. And our sector of this dimension and this universe, actually our, our sector of the universe in all the dimensions for human angelic souls is right where we are in the solar system. The thing about it is just like the Russian dolls, the different dimensions are one on top of the other so that you have earth in the first through the third, but then Terra, which is superimposed over our earth in the higher dimensions and then Gaia superimposed over that. But human angelic souls in general, um, all incarnate for the most part, particularly in the first through the third universal dimension in this particular sector of the universe, starting in the fifth universal dimension, human angelic souls do have the ability to incarnate in other regions of the universe and in other solar systems. So that does occur, but currently this is where we're at. A lot of the visitors, a lot, it's particularly extraterrestrial, although there are definitely removed by space um, extraterrestrials in, uh, you know, in our universe currently in this dimension, a lot of what is seen are actually visitors from higher dimensional planes that are passing through or that are just being seen because of a, a, a thin, um, a thin point or a thin veil in the actual uh, dimensional overlap. I did want to mention also one thing that I don't think we got to see uh, in the diagrams, but your soul creates not just one wheel of creation. You might be on one wheel of creation, and I've seen those wheels of creation have anywhere from seven to 24 lifetimes on a single wheel. There is no set number. But what you need to remember is that your soul also has other wheels and can have thousands of wheels so that literally you, your soul could be generating simultaneously thousands of lifetimes that are all related to you. But for the most part, the souls that are truly dynamically connected to you in terms of karmic balance are the ones that are on your particular wheel of creation. Okay, we have two questions. Um, uh, Barbara and Anu, sort of the same question. Can you explain what you mean by human angelic souls? Um, how does this relate to angels? And um, is every human on the planet a human angelic soul? That's an interesting question. Um, Human angelic souls, like I was saying, are the, for the most part, there are many different groups of souls that are cast out in the universe. Human angelic souls tend to be um, related to us in this particular sector of the universe and particularly in the first through the third universal dimension. There are extraterrestrial soul groups and furthermore, within the human angelic soul group or soul, I should say soul race, there are other cadres and there are other groups, there are different groups. So it gets kind of complex. However, when I refer to human angelic souls, I'm referring to, for the most part, souls that are incarnated uh, in our sector of the universe. Now, this is an interesting thing that is brought up, and I won't get too much into it, but it's, it's something that really needs to be explored. It is possible for extraterrestrial soul groups to incarnate in human form. And a lot, this has been happening more and more during this particular period. Unfortunately, from most of the information that we've remote viewed, it appears as though there is an, an, an there is a there is an attempt at a kind of bio invasion by extraterrestrial soul group one in particular 
who believes that this sector of the universe actually um, should have been related to them. And I can go further and say that it's really identified as the draconian um, and Zeta soul group that have a belief that this was uh, a sector of the universe that should have been theirs. Now, there are, there are angelic guardians, and this is also interesting because your, your guides and your and and even archangels and those that are at the higher universal dimensions in our particular sector tend to be they're mostly human angelic and most of the information that we get from human angelic guides celestial guides who are in the seventh universal dimension but ultimately this 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 attempt, it's very difficult for extraterrestrial souls to incarnate in human form without altering the biology of the human form. And many of the things that have been happening and will particularly be happening that are identified in the future over the course of the next 150, 200 years, there is a very definite attempt at transhumanism to actually modify the human gen genetic makeup in order to better accommodate extraterrestrial soul groups. Now, because of the, because of the, the angelic guardians who are human angelic, and because this sector of the universe is designated for human angelics, they will not be successful. There will be a reset of the entire planet in conjunction with the planet Earth that takes place in the 26th century. And we've remote viewed that and that is covered in timeline collapse as well. Um, it's also covered in this book, but, uh, and it might e even be mentioned in the system lords as well. For the most part, they, that will be stopped in that manner. And it's at that particular point in the 26th century that we go back to zero, which is similar to what happened approximately 13,000 years ago or with the fall of Atlantis, because, you know, frankly, there's just been, there's been amazing civilizations, you know, even as far out as 250,000 years um, prior to our own on earth. Uh, ultimately though, eventually there are resets that happen and sometimes the, sometimes the resets happen naturally. Sometimes they are orchestrated. Um, the book details, the, the, and, and it's interesting because the reason why the draconian uh, race believe this to be their sector of the universe is because they, for many, for millennia, um, had created the, the, the sort of um, the beginnings of their race that were wiped out, I think approximately 65 million years ago, and they were sort of the, rep the reptilian and the dinosaur race that was wiped out mostly by a catastrophe that was orchestrated by human angelic guardians because uh, once again, this sector of the universe was designated for human angelic souls. Now, all of that gets a little, you know, it gets a little woo woo and it gets a little out there, but, um, if you kind of give it some thought, it does make sense and it is covered in the book. So Rusty wants to know, I mean, and you, and you probably, well, I'll just, um, how can we know if we are human angelic souls or if we are ET souls? So I, I think I heard you say that ET souls have a harder time in, in incarnating as they have, humans. They have a much more difficult time incarnating as humans. Um, human angelic souls tend to be service to other souls. There are different, um, there are two, two basic different orientations when a soul is cast out. There's service to self and there's service to others. Human angelics tend to be service to others, whereas a lot of ET races, in particular, the ET soul races of these other groups, uh, the, the ones that are attempting the bio invasion, they tend to be uh, service to self. And so, it is unfortunate because they, they, they tend not to be empathetic. They tend not to um, 
there is a noticeable difference. They can almost appear selfish, a little psychotic. There are a lot of traits that um, tend to kind of uh, separate them. And most human angelics will kind of feel a little bit like, you know, something's a little off with them. And that would be kind of the, the best indication. And, and, it, and it's difficult to say, I mean, cause you can't say that about everybody. There are some people who that would be part of their life mission, but there definitely, definitely are um, those who are being incarnated are being influenced by a different soul group. They um, unfortunately, and I think this is covered in the book too, they have genetically orchestrated it so that they are incarnated in some um, high positions and positions of power and wealth. And it tends to be the reason why people who are of a certain status, either politically or uh, in terms of, or socially, will tend to, human angels will think, well, you know, they, they're a little odd. They don't seem to have any compassion. They don't seem to have any feeling for anyone. They just kind of like, you know, roll over everybody. That tends to be part of their strategy for this transhumanism and, and, and really the attempt uh, at a bioinvasion. Okay. Uh, I don't want to get too far into that just because yeah. the book really is about um, sort of what happens after you pass away. And um, it, it was needed, that I, I, I think I said it, but I, when we were first starting the book, I had a dream where I was told that because a lot of people would be cycling off and passing away um, over the next couple of decades, that that's why we needed to write the book, as I said. But I had a very interesting experience because as I was beginning to write the book, um, a friend brought someone over who I really didn't know. And he was a young man, um, like, you know, he was in his early fifties, I believe. I didn't know him, but they, as anybody would do, asked me what I was working on. And I explained about the book and he was absolutely fascinated. And he just, he stayed for hours just asking me questions about what happens when you pass away, where do you go? What do you do? You know, how do you remain conscious on and on and on? A few weeks later, I ran into my friend and I said, oh, you know, it was very interesting meeting your, your friend who you brought over. And she said, oh yeah, what a tragedy. He had, um, he had a lump on his throat and he went to the doctor and they said that he had terminal cancer and it had spread through his entire body. And within weeks he was dead. And it dawned on me, I mean, it was a tragedy, but it dawned on me that this is, this was the purpose of this book. And that's why I really, you know, I, I worked very hard on it um, because of, because really we don't have a roadmap. And I think that if you can remote view for an organization or for someone's life mission, we could also remote view as to how one passes from physical reality. And that's what we did. Absolutely. Um, Jerry wants to know, is there one oversoul for all of humanity? No, not that I have seen. Um, there are, there, I mean, there is not a, there is not a God. There are many soul groups. Um, but I have, no, I, to, in my experience, I have not seen that. No, there are over, there are oversouls. So in other words, you could consider your soul to be an oversoul because your soul is orchestrating thousands of lifetimes all happening simultaneously in the universal dimension. That qualifies to me as an oversoul. But if you're asking if there is a Papa God, if there is one God figure, I have, no, I have not seen that. There is a, there is a cosmic energy. There isn't, I call it all that is. There is a universal truth. There is a universal allness um, and creative force that actually pushes out these um, these souls as 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 cells within its body. But I, I hesitate to call it an oversoul, just as I hesitate to call it God, because that that sort of um, it, it brings up so many images for people, and it connotates so many different things that are really not valid that um, we tend not to use that term. 
Okay. Um, how many oversouls are there? Is that a question you can answer? There, there's there's really no limit. And again, um, you know, not an oversoul, but there, say your soul, there are soul groups. There is no defined number and they're constantly being um, put out into the universe. So, and again, you have to follow the pattern of what happens here. A soul is cast out from the creative force. That soul then creates its own beings in the form of lifetimes and then reintegrates them. And then that soul reintegrates those lifetimes, continues on and goes and ultimately ends up through its journey reintegrating with the creative force that first cast it out. And then you have to understand that this is happening with numerous souls, you know, just, I has to say a number because there really is no number, but it's just endless. It's just forever. Um, so Anu and Mary have a, a very, very similar questions. Um, so Mary says, why if we're living simultaneous, uh, so, so simultaneously living many lifetimes, why are we only aware really of the present one? And why are we not aware of them all? It's, it's because of the level of consciousness and because of the level that we're at. And it's because higher can see lower, but lower cannot see higher in terms of a universal law. Um, for the most part, the, the seventh dimensional entities can see higher and lower, can also know all the lifetimes that of which it's a part. Um, we are at a level of consciousness where that's just not available to us because we're intended to focus on other things. Um, so if someone's having a past life regression um, mm -hmm. and they're just seeing a life that another part of their, their soul is having, yes. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems, this is from Anu, it seems we only have access to some of these other lives. Um, um, yeah, yes. do, we, do we only have access to the lives with which we have a strong connection from where, from this vantage point. For the most part, yes. And regression is a misnomer because you're not being regressed. You're actually being opened up to a vision of what is currently happening. But like I said, for the most part, you have a special connection with the other entities that are on your particular soul. Now there is no set number. So there could be I've seen as few as six, and there can be as many as 24. Uh, that's, that's in terms of what I've seen. That doesn't mean that that's, you know, it's limited to that, but there can be any number. Those tend to be the lifetimes that are most connected to you, but you do have connection to the other wheels and to the other lifetimes, but it's indirect. In terms of karma and in terms of the dy dynamicism of the karma, it's mostly the wheels, it's mostly the lifetimes that are on your wheel that are bleeding through and going back and forth to you because you're balancing out that wheel and they're balancing it out as well. Okay, so um, Mary, this is coming in from YouTube. If my loved one is visiting me after their physical death, mm -hmm. is their soul aware that they are visiting? Yes. Um, are they already reincarnated to, into another physical lifetime and yet visiting me? Okay, that is, that's the other misnomer. Yes, they know that they're visiting you, particularly if they have reached the fifth or the sixth astral plane. They will visit you um, when, if you think of them, they will generally visit you in the, uh, in the, dreams, in the dreamscape, what I call the dreamscape, um, which is then really essentially the fourth astral level, which is where you go when you dream. It says in the book also that, you know, that the fear of death really uh, is a little bit uh, of, a, of, of something that is unnecessary because you essentially visit where you will go every night when you go to sleep and you're in the dream state. Now, that's only temporary because you're only in that state as, you, as a passage through to the higher states. But um, according to the book, particularly when entities are in the fifth healing realm. That's where they are very much connected to lo loved ones who have passed away. That's when they come and visit. That's when they talk because they are at that particular point in a certain sense, reviewing life 
from all different angles and everything. And that's when they will kind of, for the most part, make contact with you. After that particular point, it becomes a little bit more problematic because then it's kind of like the analogy I think that's given in the book is sort of like, you know, for the first couple of sublevels, when someone passes away and they're making contact with someone who's in physical reality, it's because they're connected. It's very similar to if your, you know, your friend or your loved one um, moves to Europe, and at first they're contacting you all the time and they're sending cards and they're calling you. And then as time goes by, they're calling you once a week. And then as more time goes by, maybe every six months. And then, and it just gets further and further until you reach the point where, okay, you know, maybe occasionally if you think of them, they will be connected to you. And will you know, if you think of them, they will come, but it's much different because don't forget they're not just sitting around eating grapes they're they're sort of their consciousness is continuing they're doing things particularly in perceived heaven when they're in perceived heaven that's really where you get to explore everything that you ever wanted to do um, but potentially we're not able to because that's where you really kind of are investigating who you truly are and your real truth Okay, good. So, um, we talked a little bit before we started, uh, you and I, about the question that came in from Bruce about yep. when souls incarnate. incarnate. Yep. So, yep. Um, he has a, a little more um, detailed okay. question here. How okay. does the soul enter into joining the body in a lifetime? Is it at the moment of fertilization or other moments intrauter utero, or perhaps over a lifetime? I've often, I've thought in the same way with that we have stem cells in biology, we yeah. also have stem souls that come into our human bodies in our life in an undifferentiated way. And then we differentiate into our particular um, person or individual. Yes, okay. Um, the, the entry into the physical body can take place at any time. There is no designated time. Um, it can take place at the moment of conception, but it doesn't have to. It can also, it generally takes place up until even a few hours after birth. More than likely, it sort of starts to take place a few months before, particularly if there is connection between the family, uh, uh, the mother in particular, and the, uh, the child in some way from a soul connection. You know, a soul made, a task made, a, you know, some way there's a connection. The interesting thing, though, is, you know, with regard to um, even the question of abortion, which is a very tricky thing to talk about. However, you need to remember that, um, you know, there can be souls that are having a mission. There can be souls that where a miscarriage is in order to give an opportunity for growth to the parents. But for the most part, because time is simultaneously and all happening together, the soul will know that the, um, that the birth is not going to happen or that there is not going to be viable and therefore will generally not, in, will not fuse with the physical body um, because of that. So th that it really is a question of every single entity is completely different, depending on the connection, depending on what the soul mission is, depending on what the purpose is. There are souls who might fuse with the body early on, even knowing that it was going to be terminated for the purposes of soul growth. Um, but more than likely, that is not the case. Uh, in terms of what he was talking about with the stem cells, which I think is a very interesting question, you have to remember that the cells in the body, particularly the DNA, is a communications vehicle. And so stem cells and cells in general are always communicating back with your soul, sort of the, the state, the emotional content, sort of where you are. So I don't know exactly how that plugs into what he was asking. However, I would think that because the DNA is so important in terms of being almost like an antennae that communicates with your soul, that that's essentially um, what he's talking about. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, it does. Okay. Um, 
Kathy wants to know, is source loving? I'm sorry, say that again. Is source with a capital S? Yes. Loving. Source is all that is. And yes, yes. And, you know, there is, in my experience, there is no, well, it's just like I say, from a higher perspective and from a, high, from a higher dimensional viewpoint, there is no good, bad, right, or wrong. It is all that is. And that tends to be unconditional and that tends to be loving. Excellent. Um, Philip, um, Philippe wants to know, can you explain what seems to be very dark energies now happening at the collective and political level, whether um, in this country or abroad? Yeah. Um, the, you know, again, we have to go back to the no good, bad, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. But there is something definitely that's happening that needs to be understood by everybody. Because of the ascension energies that are happening right now, because there are older souls living alongside younger souls, the older souls are kind of, their motto would be live and let live and have a happy life and I'm gonna cycle off. Younger souls learn through karma. And so they tend to be denser, they tend, you know, no pun intended, they tend to be of much greater density, lower to the earth, they're younger, they tend to think of things as me and other me's. And I want the whole world to look like me and if it doesn't, I'm gonna force it to look like me. What's happening in the world right now is that um, during this period of ascension, which has really been taking place now for over the last 100 years and will continue for the next 150, 200 years, older souls will be cycling off and there won't be further incarnations that they're having, whereas younger souls are all coming in, particularly younger souls that have now just graduated because of ascension from lower densities or lower universal dimensions. They're now having their first lifetimes in the third universal dimension. So there is this gigantic schism that is happening between older souls and younger souls. And that's essentially the way we see it. And that's going to be the case over the course of the next coming years. So it is going to be more and more problematic. What's going to happen is older souls will find, like attracts like, they will find each other. Younger souls will look for karma and they will create chaos in order to create karma, which for them in their world is, are opportunities for growth. And that tends to be what's happening. And much of the predictions in timeline collapse are related to that whole entire scenario with respect to how it applies to what will happen in America, what will happen in the world. And that's really where it comes from. So it's hard to see it as good or bad, or it, it, but it, it definitely is problematic. It definitely is challenging. As younger souls proliferate, there's going to be more and more challenges and they're going to seem much greater for older souls who kind of just want to live and let live and kind of, you know, enjoy their lifetime. Um, how does the concept of old souls versus young souls apply when ultimately there is no time? That's interesting. And, it's, and it has to do with when they actually move into the universal dimension. So a younger soul will be a soul that is just ascending or coming into the dimension from a lower universal dimension, whereas an older soul will be a soul that has many, many lifetimes happening already and has already generated and created, you know, thousands of lifetimes and essentially is finishing them up and getting ready to ascend into the next universal dimension. So soul age is more related to that than anything else. Okay, good. So I'm gonna do uh, three or four more questions because I'm aware okay. of the time. And okay. um, sure. um, are there hell-like realms? No, no. And, and as we said, um, th there is the, the first, universal dimension, um, because it is related to 
you know, density and rocks and mountains and caves. That tends to be where the mythology comes from. That's also a place where when you're talking about the third universal dimension, negative thought forms tend to congregate in because they are so dense and because they are there. So there are negative thought forms, but the one thing to always keep in mind is that, like I said, higher can see lower, but lower can't see higher. Higher always has dominion over lower. So that's very important in terms of negative thought forms, negative challenges, things that are happening. Always remember that you have dominion over those things. But in terms of in terms of a hell concept, there is no such thing that does not exist. The reason why that um, mythology comes about is because as we were talking about in the sixth um, perceived heaven, once you have gone through the cathartic plane, once you have gone through the healing of all the karma, whatever you, your impression is of yourself having gone through that, that's what's then reflected for you. So most people who go through it who you know fa did fairly positive things in their life will feel accomplished and because of that that accomplishment will then be reflected back to them in terms of their environment however there's going to be some people who really you know didn't don't feel that way especially after seeing everything from everyone else's perspective because don't forget that in the fifth the fifth healing plane, the karmic balancing plane, you experience everything that you've ever done, but you experience it not only from your perspective, but from the perspective of the person that you did it to. When that happens, that then, when you come through that, what is reflected back to you in terms of perceived heaven might not be so great. And that's where the mythology of hell actually comes from but there is no hell. Okay, so I'm gonna do two more questions and I apologize to the people that I, that I can't get to. Um, um, when you get an organ transplant, are you impacted from having another person's DNA join your body? There is generally when that happens, it is because there was an agreement for that to happen, but it does not impact it does not impact you. However, for the most part, from anything I've ever seen, there is a connection to you and to your soul group. And that was intended to actually happen for you, which is why it really does not affect you in that particular way. And then the other thing about okay. it is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you, go ahead. No, that's all right, I'm done. That's, that's fine. Okay. So the last question, the last question is from Leslie. Um, so how do we make the most of this life, this one that we're aware of? Is yeah, it appropriate, this... applicable for us to fulfill our heart's desires? You know, no, I mean, I, the, the easy answer is no, but the most important thing that you can do in this lifetime is be aware be conscious of who you are and be aware of your essence path. It becomes very important, and I said this at the beginning, to know thyself because you have a life lesson and it's really not even necessary for you to know your life lesson. But what is necessary to know is that the, the things that were created in your environment that you chose to have created in your environment, the prejudices, the... Uh, the parameters, the way in which you see the world, that actually all affects your reality. And so it's very important to work on yourself and to be conscious of who you are and what you're about and the reason why you think what you think and you feel what you feel, because that is what goes out into the world. And that is what then draws reality to you. And so I would say, the most important thing that you can do is make every attempt and be have an intention, a conscious intention to be on your essence path at all times. Because 
just by having the conscious intention of being on your essence path, that will make you more conscious, more aware. It will help you to understand your the parameters, the way in which you see the world. And then that will draw to you the reality and the world that was intended for you. Now, I do have to say the caveat is you have to understand that there are certain things that happen to you for purposes of growth. And your soul's idea of growth. Are you still there, Judy? Uh, hmm. Judy, are you still there? Okay, well, anyway, I'll continue. In any case, the answer, if anyone is still there, um, <laughs> is that um, being on your essence path, discovering your essence path, and trying to push your life into the positive polarity is probably the most important thing that you can do. Understanding all the while that there are certain things that you've actually created or that you want to have happen in this life for purposes of growth. And those things are not good or bad or right or wrong. They are things that you and your soul are, attr are attracting into your life for purposes of growth. And uh, that makes a lifetime successful. Okay. Are you there? Thank you, Gene. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened I guess, to Judy. I, I guess we lost Judy. <laughs> yes. And, and I, I apologize to everybody because Judy's the host and she's got the questions and she's in charge. Um, but I think that um, Maybe. Uh oh, I think we lost Judy. Okay. <laughs> so, well, in any case, you know, um, I think we've reached the end, and so yeah, I'm going, I'm going to I'm going to say to everybody, thank you for joining us tonight, um, and uh, wishing you every blessing. And I think someone asked whether this recording will be available um, online. I, I, I believe it will be, yes. you know, uh, I don't know if to this point, but at some particular point, <laughs> okay. up to some point. But thank you everybody for, for attending. And uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully speaking with you again sometime in the future. <laughs> thank you, Gene. <laughs> okay. Good night. Bye, everybody. <laughs> thank you.